Es un placer estar acá otra vez en, en el auditorio de, de la Fundación OSDE, que es eh, para nosotros siempre como una segunda casa, que nos recibe siempre también. Y quiero agradecer muy especialmente a la OEI y a la UNIPE, organizadores de este evento y que han tenido la iniciativa de invitar al profesor Pierre Levy a Buenos Aires. Agradecerles que hayan confiado en mí para hacer esta presentación eh, y decirles que para mí es un gran gusto presentar al profesor Levy y también eh, va a ser un, un gusto escucharlo y eh, como él mismo lo ha sugerido, tener con todos ustedes un diálogo a través de las preguntas que puedan formular. O sea que eh, él me ha pedido que el, eh, después del tiempo de exposición tengamos un buen tiempo para responder preguntas, así que le daremos a eso un espacio también. Eh, muchos de ustedes seguramente conocen la obra del profesor Levy. Eh, podríamos, podríamos decir que algo de la recepción de la obra del profesor Levy en Argentina eh, comienza a darse hace ya bastante tiempo eh, cuando fueron conocidos acá algunos de sus trabajos, este, en particular eh, el texto de ¿Qué es lo virtual? Eh, que es un texto de 1995, pero que fue traducido bastante tempranamente por un amigo y colega, Diego Levis, este, que lo tradujo y que fue editado acá en 1998. Hay una primera corrección del autor, eh, corrección a un pedido del autor, que es el siguiente. Nos ha pedido que pueden sacar fotos, pero que no usen el flash, porque el flash eh, suele este, ser bastante molesto en el momento de hablar. Entonces les ruego que, 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 que silencien el flash. Eh, y después de la conferencia, el profesor Levy va a aceptar el uso del flash en alguna foto que podamos sacar <risa> grupal. Ese es un pedido que le acabo de hacer como moderado, ¿no? Después de, de la... Les decía, eh, la, la, la obra de, del profesor Levy, que seguramente muchos de ustedes conocen y que conocimos allí en los 90, y que tenía... Eh, formaba parte de un conjunto de, de obras y de reflexiones que... Muy tempranamente, digo, para lo que fue el desarrollo de Internet y pensando además que Internet, la cara gráfica de Internet, la web, lo que más impacto ha producido eh, es del año 94, o sea que en la década del 90 el profesor Levy eh, tiene un, un conjunto de textos que nos, nos llevan a, a pensar en temas que los seguimos discutiendo y debatiendo durante 20 años. Eh, la, decía, el texto de... Eh, inteligencia colectiva, que es del año 94, nosotros lo conocimos en español 10 años después por una traducción que hizo la OPS, eh, que además con derechos gratuitos cedidos por el profesor Levy, que se publicó en la web. Eh, conocimos qué es lo virtual, eh, Cibercultura, que es un libro del año 97, este, y muchos de, de estos trabajos además los conocimos por eh, lectores de, de Pierre Levy, o sea, de quienes también nos trajeron la obra del profesor Levy, eh, algunos profesores argentinos, como recién mencionaba a, a Diego Levis, pero también porque otro, otro investigador que nos ha visitado y que nosotros hemos seguido su obra, que es Henry Jenkins, es también un lector eh, y no sé si amigo, pero un, un eh, pan amigo, es un colega. Es un amigo de Facebook. Friend. Ah, Facebook. Uh, friend. <laughs> we we follow each other on Twitter. Ah, <laughs> Yo diría que todos esos trabajos que despertaron en nosotros eh, bastante interés y que el profesor Levy además dejó sentados allí eh, varias discusiones. Eh, que tienen que ver, por ejemplo, con eh, el tema del nuevo nomadismo del, del siglo XXI y, el, y, la, y la particularidad que tienen los medios electrónicos en producir estos efectos culturales, lingüísticos, eh, sobre las prácticas cotidianas de los ciudadanos, pero también sobre las instituciones. Fue acompañado también eh, por un ambicioso proyecto que tiene 
20 años, y algo de esto justamente nos va a hablar hoy el profesor Levy, que fue el, la, el, este proyecto que, que es el Information Economy Meta Language, que es un, un proyecto eh, que, que pretende justamente, yo diría, no solo eh, ingresar en este debate sobre la web semántica, este, eh, sino, sino que eh, es una especie de, de creación de un metalenguaje de la economía de la información y del modo en el cual eh, circulan estos bienes simbólicos que han decantado en la web. ¿no? Es decir, el profesor Levy a, 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 en esto ha periodizado eh, ese momento en el cual los que tenemos algunos años recordamos, donde el conocimiento que producíamos estaba en nuestras computadoras. Estábamos orgullosos, por ejemplo, del tamaño del disco rígido que tenía nuestra, nuestra computadora y la capacidad de, de almacenar información. Luego esto se volcó a, a una Internet naciente, que fue una segunda etapa, el mismo profesor le había dicho, es una segunda etapa donde empezamos a hacer circular esta información y el correo electrónico era una revolución en esto, el email. Pero la tercera etapa, que es la aparición de la red, de la web, de lo que nosotros conocemos, es para, la, para los trabajos que él ha presentado, es justamente un salto cualitativo y diferencial. ¿no? Y entonces, ya, no, ya no, no, él comienza a hablar no solo de una web semántica, sino de una web algorítmica. ¿no? Y empezamos a pensar esto a partir de cómo esa enorme masa de información se ordena en la web circula allí y sobre todo los modos en los cuales nosotros tenemos acceso a esa masa de información. ¿Por qué? Bueno, porque estamos atravesados por un conjunto de buscadores que tienen una, un algoritmo que los informa, que los inspira, que los lleva a, a perforar, perforar capas muy superficiales de la web, muy pequeñas de la web. ¿no? Este, eh, ustedes saben que Google, por ejemplo, es un, es un buscador soberbio que nos dice que en 0,24 fracciones de segundo nos dio 2.342.000 resultados. Y esa soberbia eh, significa decirnos que perforó el 1% de la web. ¿no? Este, pero además lo busca con un criterio que es un criterio que que tiene Google más como empresa comercial y como una manera de utilizar su propio algoritmo en base a, a, por ejemplo, a frecuencias de búsqueda o cosas por el estilo, o quien paga para estar primero en esas búsquedas también, pero no, no, no logra hacer conectar esta información, este acervo que existe en la web y trabajar a, a partir, por ejemplo, de palabras claves o de, o de formas en las cuales están conectándose esto que el profesor Levy dice que, que vivimos y que es una, esta revolución en nuestro tiempo, produciendo esta, este, este conocimiento colectivo, esta inteligencia colectiva que vivimos. Entonces, eh, el profesor Levy toma esta, este, este enorme desafío de crear un proyecto que... Después de tantos años vamos a conocer. Hoy es la noche de la revelación. Hoy el profesor Levy revelará este conocimiento. Pero además, este, esto está en un, buena parte de esto está en un libro, que es un libro eh, de Semantic Sphere del 2011, o sea, muy reciente, y que eh, nos han anunciado que va a ser traducido al castellano, con lo cual, sí, va a circular más rápidamente, sobre todo en, en América Latina y en los medios académicos latinoamericanos. Bueno... Eh, estamos muy ansiosos de escucharlo, yo solamente quería presentarlo para decir eh, hay mucha expectativa en todos los que conocemos su obra desde hace unos cuantos años en escuchar al profesor Levy y en también en seguir este diálogo eh, en, en el tiempo. Así que bienvenido a Buenos Aires, bienvenido a, a, a OSDE que nos recibe, bienvenido a, eh, a las dos instituciones además que usted ya conoce, el, la OEI y la UNIPE que lo han recibido y lo escuchamos con mucho gusto. Thank you very much. Now it's difficult to speak after this because he already told everything. <laughs> But, okay. Um, maybe there are people in the room that do not know my work. So modestly, I would like to present a little bit The, the general perspective of my 
research. Um, I, I began my research on these subjects at the end of the 70s, of the last century, of course. And at this time, uh, I, I realized that there was a, a, a strange process going on. All the computers are, were uh, connecting each other through communication networks. Um, so uh, at this time, I read some technical reports and so on, and I understood at the end of the 70s that a, a great uh, cognitive revolution was ongoing. And it was just, it was not just the computers, but the interconnection of the computers and the interconnection of the people through a network of computers. And also, all these computers, they, they contain data. So you have the people, the algorithmic power of the computer, and the data. And all this uh, accessible through a global network. So this, I, I, I say to myself, this is the thing that I want to study and to understand. And eventually, um, the thing in the, 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 the technical and cultural process in which I want to, to work, in, uh, that, that, that I want to, to improve, uh, where this is the place where I want to make my contribution. But my first contribution should be help people understanding what's going on. And of course, to help people understand what's going on, I had to understand it myself. Uh, at, at this, <laughs> at, all the professors know this process. We, we learn because we, we want to teach. So at, at the same time, at the end of the 70s, the beginning of the 80s, I was um, studying uh, history of science and uh, cultural and anthropologic uh, history. And I discovered that uh, one of the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the main property of the human mind is that we manipulate symbols, okay, contrary to the animals. And the, this process of symbol manipulation has always been augmented by tools, like, for example, the writing systems, uh, the alphabet, uh, the ways to note numbers, uh, and then the printing press, and then the electronic media, and so on. And at each of these big steps in the general progress of the uh, intellectual technologies, there has been huge consequences on our uh, knowledge of the world in, in which we live, and also uh, big cultural, political, religious consequences. And this should not be a surprise, because it is, it is our mind that creates our culture. Okay? So if our mind is enhanced, our culture is transformed. So, and we, I realized that we were precisely at a, we, we were living in a moment where a big revolution in not only in communication, but in symbol manipulation in general was happening. So what kind of 
civilization are we going to create? That was my question. And I'm not sure that the, the people who invented writing systems or who invented uh, or who developed the, the first printing press and so on were fully conscious that these technical or symbolic coding systems would have such important cultural consequences. But we, with our uh, historical knowledge, are able to understand that this would, would have important consequences. So maybe we can orient the development of the technology for cultural or civilizational purposes. Okay. Um, so, what if, if I the 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 goal that I was trying to explain in my book, Collective Intelligence, or if you want. The question to which I was trying to answer was, what are we going to do with all these technologies? What is, if we want to have a goal, what, what would it be? It, I was not thinking in terms of impact. I was thinking in terms of projects. Okay, we, we have this, what can we do with it? And the first answer that came to me is that we should augment human cognition. Okay. This is a, an all-encompassing goal <laughs> that has a lot of consequences. Okay. It's the most fundamental. But this is not such a trivial answer. Because at the time, the best minds were not giving the same answer as me. Their answer to the question was, we are going to create an artificial intelligence. Okay, so there was a choice here. So for me, the enemies were <laughs> the people of artificial intelligence and the friends were the people of cognitive augmentation, okay, like Douglas and Gulbart, for example. And as human cognition is inherently social or collective or cultural, call it as you want, we cannot, we are uh, social animals, we are or political animals, as, as Aristotle said. So uh, we did not invent the language with, 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 uh, with which we speak. We uh, received the, the, the great uh, majority of our knowledge from, uh, uh, from the school or for family transmission or from our peers and so on. So everything we know we, we get it from, from society, okay? And the thing that we invent, we invent from what already exists in our culture, from our memory, from discussion with others, from co collaboration, and so on. So that's why I was speaking about collective intelligence. Stop. Collective intelligence is not groupthink. Okay, it's not everybody is going to think the same way. No, not at all. <laughs> Just because uh, there, sometimes there is this misunderstanding. Uh, collective intelligence is a way to, um, uh, in, in my view of collective intelligence, is all-inclusive. Okay, it, it encompasses all the diversity of the human mind, okay? It's not something that restricts anything, okay? It, it is, in a way, the, the set of all the thoughts and all the meanings that have ever been developed by human beings 
or that will be developed by human beings. It's, a, it's an immense, uh, infi almost infinite cosmos, okay? But for the moment, it is invisible. So, so let's now, let's have a look at this new medium that I call the algorithmic medium. I call it algorithmic because the core of this new medium is the uh, ability to manipulate symbols automatically, to transform symbols automatically, even industrially, okay? Not only to multiply symbols, not only to broadcast signs, but to transform. Because we already have this ability to transmit, copy, multiply, and so on. This we have, okay? Now, in this huge telecommunication infosphere, where the, all the data are, are in, in, in this space, we are able to, to transform the content, to transform the data automatically. So, how does it work? So, I decided to, to, to analyze it to really understand how it works. So the first step that began, let's say, at the end of the 40s or the beginning of the 50s was the creation of the, the computers, the electronic computers. Basically, a computer is an electronic memory and you have a processor that goes into this memory at precise addresses that takes the information that is coded in a binary way that transforms this information and the results of the transformation is sent back to the memory at a very precise address. So the, the basis of this is that we have a, a precise address for the data and a precise address of every operator or processor that makes the transformation on the data. Okay? And a program says basically use such an operator on such data. It's, I resume, but it's not so complex in principle, I mean. Okay. And these addresses of the operators and the data are, were at the beginning local on one computer. The computers were not interconnected. Okay. At this time, it was only the, the big companies, the big governments, and very specialized scientists who were using computers. And the second step was the invention of an ad, a new layer of addressing. This is the internet. What is the internet? It's just an addressing system for the computers, in the network of computers. Thanks to this addressing system, all the computers can communicate through whatever network. It can be, uh, it can be on wires, uh, it can be uh, Hertzian waves, it can be... But what is important is that every processor of information have an address. And at the same time, the computers themselves became less expensive, uh, smaller, and were appropriated by people. Okay? This is the beginning of personal computing. So there was personal computers, and all these computers were interconnecting. Okay? At the beginning, there was different ways to address these computers in the networks. But uh, eventually, in the, at, at the end, there was one system of addressing that emerged 
as the best, and it was the internet. Okay, the internet itself has been invented in 69, but it became universal in the 80s, in fact. Okay. Um, and at the time, uh, let's say in the 70s, in the 80s, the computers were mainly um, tools to improve the performances of intellectual workers or in information workers, okay. uh, text processing, uh, uh, spreadsheets, uh, uh, the beginning of design or drawing by computers and so on. I, when I wrote the, the, the book Collective Intelligence, it was published in 94. But if you read it attentively, you will... <laughs> sure that you no. did it. But, I mean, if you, if you make a search on the text, there is no... The word web does not exist. Okay? Because when I wrote it, there was no World Wide Web. Okay? And at the time, there was only 1% of, or less of 1% of the world population that was connected to the internet. Okay, it was not a social phenomenon at the time. It was a techno-scientific thing, but so. And at this time, I envisaged the, fu the, the, the future of this technology, and I, I predicted that it will become the platform of human collective intelligence. Of course, human intelligence has always been collective. I'm, I'm not pretending that I have invented collective intelligence. The bees or the ants have invented collective intelligence. And of course, human culture is collective intelligence from the beginning. Okay. But it, I, wh wh what I meant is that it will be the contemporary platform, symbolic, uh, techno-symbolic platform of collective intelligence. Okay, that was my big claim. And that this collective intelligence would be able to evolve and to become actual in real time that people we would be able to, to communicate immediately, to, to, to uh, collaborate, to organize themselves, and so on. So, and then <laughs> there was the web. <laughs> so, um, by the way, I have to, to explain that it, it just because you, um, Diego, Ask me in the car, how, how did you come with this idea that it, it would become the platform of collective intelligence? Because I was personally working in the design of a software tool to improve knowledge management, to improve collaborative learning, to create a kind of market of projects and skills in real time where people would be able to form teams and so on. So I was practically involved in the design of such kind of system. This was the real thing that gave me the in intuition. It was not dreams or things like this. Okay? It was based on a practical work. So there was the, the development of the web. Um, let's have a little, let, let, let's go back in the very, very ancient times. Google was created in 98, Wikipedia in 2001. Uh, the, the, the beginning of the blogosphere is 2002. Uh, the first social bookmarking tools uh, appeared in 2003. And three. This is very important, uh, social bookmarking, because it was a, a way to 
to mutu mutualize the, the memory of the web. Uh, I like this website instead of just having a bookmark on my browser. Uh, I put this bookmark in, in, uh, in a memory in the cloud and everybody can access and we can share all our discoveries on the web. Okay? So this was really a beginning of real collective intelligence. And by the way, Google exploits the collective intelligence of the people because the results is based, the famous Google algorithm is based on the number of links that goes to a website, number of links coming from websites that are themselves referenced a lot by other websites. So the, it's the users mm -hmm. of the, the web that, um, that feed the Google algorithm. Okay, it's not the, the algorithm alone, it's the people. Okay, so Google extracts the collective intelligence of the people. Um, and then it was the development of social media. Uh, of course, virtual communities existed since the beginning of the 80s, by the way. And I participated to these things, but it was not popular. So Flickr, for example, to, to share photographs. Uh, Facebook appeared in 2004. YouTube 2005 and Twitter that we love so much <laughs> in 2006. Okay, it's almost. So currently, what we have is um, a dialectic between cloud computing, that is, the memory of the data is mainly out of our hard disks, okay? It is in huge data centers that we don't know where they are, okay? And they communicate between themselves. And from our point of view, the information is ubiquitous, okay? For example, a very simple example in fa Facebook, you don't have the application on your computer and you don't have the data Okay, everything is in the clouds. So, cloud computing and big data, an enormous quantity of data. And of course, big data analysis. And it is, uh, it is based on this analysis of big data that are in the clouds that algorithm decides what you see on your, on your Facebook timeline, for example. Okay. And this is the current situation. And I should add that in, let's say, 95, there was one or less than 1% of the world population connected. 20 years after, there are, how many, the sociologist, a percentage of the world population that is connected? Uh, 20%? 40%. No. Incroyable. Incroyable. No, no, but it is really, if you don't know it, you, you don't believe it. Because what? 40% already? <laughs> because it was... Uh, Three, three years ago, it was, it, it, it was 30, it was 30 percent, and, and 10 years ago, it was only 5 percent. Okay, so it's, it's growing very fast. So in, a, in, I don't know, in 5, 10 years, it will be more than 50 percent. I'm speaking of the world population, including Africa, Asia, Latin America, and so on. And of course, there are more Chinese people connected than Americans, for example. Okay. Um, so it's fantastic. Now we have a global public sphere where everybody can communicate. We can participate to, let's say, the political life of any country in the world. 
we can read the newspapers, we can uh, discuss with, with people and so on. It's incredible if you really use all the, the new possibilities. So is it, it, let's say it is, yes, it is collective intelligence based on the internet. Okay, it's, it's real, it's happening. What will be the next step? Okay, this is my problem. <laughs> because 20 years ago, I said, collective intelligence. What I'm going to, to say now, I was right. This is dumb, okay? But, okay, I was right, but it's not interesting to be right. I, I want to take risks. So, what I say is, the next step is reflexive collective intelligence. This means that we should be able to observe the cognitive processes that we are uh, creating together, in which we are taken together. Okay. We should be able to observe our own collective intelligence in order to improve it or in order to pilot, to drive it. Because currently, we don't know exactly what we are doing together. And uh, maybe some of you know this uh, famous image of the internet. You see a kind of big network full of colors and connections and so on, but okay, they tell you that this comes from real data, okay, I see a big network, but what, what does it mean? Who are these people? What are, are they talking about? What are all these data referring to? Okay, we don't know. So, or maybe some people know, like, the, for example, Google, uh, but in a very narrow way, okay? It's just to exploit the marketing aspect of it, okay, to, to, to sell ads, okay? So, but th there are so other many ways to exploit all this wealth of data, and not only the data in a, in a static sense, but the, the dynamics of the transformation of data coming from the interaction between the people. That's the interesting thing. We want to see this. We want to be able to, to go into this representation of collective intelligence as if it was a, a virtual world that we can observe. So, how can we do this? Mm. I have to read my pencil. I don't remember. I, I, ah, okay. So, so, there are problems currently. The first problem is that there is no semantic interoperability. That means you, we, we cannot go smoothly from one language, no, no, no flash, from one language to another. There is no real translation, automatic translation, I mean. Uh, and it's not only between the languages, but also between the disciplines, between the cultures, between the classification systems, and so Think of one thing. Uh, every library has a classification system, okay? There is one library, one classification system of this library. Everything is perfect. But the classification systems are different from one library to another library, mm -hmm. from one country to another country. They, there are European system, American system, Indian systems, uh, Chinese systems, and so on. But at a time when all the uh, memory is concentrated in the clouds, 
it is a terrible fragmentation. Okay? But we don't have a, a universal classification system for this. And we don't have any people, by the way, to classify all the information. It would be completely impossible to do it uh, by human ways, except if we take the classification of the collective intelligence, except if we crowdsource the classification or the categorization, and of course, if we accept that the same data can be categorized in a different way by different people living in different contexts. Okay. So no semantic interoperability. And if we want to create a model or a simulation of the human mind, basically, we need a, a, a scientific model of the human mind. Do we have a scientific model of the human mind? Does cognitive science offers us this model? We know that there are a lot of studies. We know that people are studying the, the human brain. We know that we can reproduce by algorithms some perceptive processes. We know that we can reproduce automatically logical reasoning. We know that we can reproduce automatically numerical computing. But can we reduce uh, the human thought to quantitative computing or just logical computing or pattern recognition? How do, do we integrate all this? Okay, what's the... Uh, for me, what was really missing was a model of the way the language works, the way we are doing semantic processing. And that's why I was led <laughs> to <laughs> invent um, uh, a computable model of the linguistic aspects of human cognition. Do you want that I repeat? Yes? yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, we know how to, to model logical thinking. We know how to model arithmetic computation or even geometrical demonstration, all the, these mathematical things, okay. We know how to model pattern recognition, perception, okay. We don't know how we understand the phrases that we are currently understanding or not, the phrases that I am uttering, okay. So, you... <laughs> You can, you can say that, okay, what he just said, does it correspond to what I have read somewhere else, for example? But the, this, the fact that you ask a question, the fact that you are able to compare several propositions, and you, you are really able to compare these propositions, to say that, it, yes, it is almost the same thing, or it is the same thing, or it is not at all, or it is another subject. You know all this spontaneously, because you manipulate this fantastic symbolic system that is language. Okay, okay you could say, yes, but Chomsky has formalized language. Was it language or syntax? It was syntax, it was not language. Because the language has also a semantic and a pragmatic aspect and not only, this is well known, it's not, this is not news, okay? It's well known by everybody that the language has syntactic 
and the semantic and the pragmatic aspect. Currently, we have only formalized the syntactic aspect. So I think that when we are in an environment when we know all the social connections of people, we know when they exchange messages, where they are, when they do this, and so on, we have more or less the pragmatic environment. We know the I like, I don't like, and so on. But the semantic aspect, no. It is not computable. You can make, uh, you can make statistics on the occurrences of strings of characters, because the computers can recognize strings of characters, but they cannot recognize concepts, okay? And this is the conceptual aspect. So, uh, that's why I decided to develop a code to represent the concepts that we express with language in order to be able to compute the semantic relationships inside the text and between the texts. Okay. And if we categorize the data with this semantic code, we will get uh, automatically the semantic relationship between the data, and it, it will emerge spontaneously. Okay. And this way we will uh, be able to model the collective cognition, for example, in, in a kind of 3D interactive, immersive, emerging simulation. Okay. It, it would be as if we were emerged in a representation of, in a dynamic representation of collective intelligence. And we, we would be able to observe it from a particular semantic point of view. But if we take another point of view, we will see another landscape, okay? But the point is, if anybody takes the same position, they would see the same landscape. So it's shareable. Okay. Um, so you see uh, why it is so, so complex, because I had to solve a lot of problems. Now, I'm not pretending that the language that I have invented will be the language that will be effectively used in the future. I don't know. This I, I don't know. But what I know, because I have done it, what I know is that it is possible. It is technically possible. That's my claim. Okay. Now I have to create a demonstration. I need a lot of engineers and so on. But the the, the code, the, the the linguistic and mathematical aspect, this is done. It took me 15 years. Okay. The, no, it was not easy. I have to say. But now I know that it is possible. I I have done it not in the. Uh, in the hope that I will become rich and famous and so on. I, I have done it to know if it was possible. Okay, it's, it's a scientific research. Exactly like Chomsky, before Chomsky, there was no formal model of the syntactic relations in, in the languages. Okay. So if uh, I'm forced to compare myself, let's say, to Chomsky. As Chomsky has formalized syntax, I think that I have formalized semantics. It's a scientific work. For the moment, it is still, I have no 
tools for the moment. I have no, uh, I, I have no company. I cannot offer services and so on. Okay, now, if you want this, you'll have to to build it yourself, and you you'll have to read 2,000. And 50 pages of mathematics or informal linguistics, but I am I am confident. I, I will show you a model of uh, what could be a representation of collective intelligence. Okay. You see, a model of collective intelligence, how do you represent collective intelligence? It's impossible. No, it's possible. Of course, I have to present it in one slide, so I cannot go into all the details. So, you see, in my, um, uh, in my perspective, you cannot separate collective intelligence and human development. As I said yesterday, um, the collective intelligence is the engine of human development, and human development is the goal, even if it is not the explicit goal, it is the implicit goal of collective intelligence. So we can decompose this uh, collective intelligence into two aspect, ah, it should not be real, it should be actual, okay, because every, even the virtual is real, okay, this is just for the translation, okay, so there is a virtual and an actual aspect, the virtual encompasses the knowledge, because knowledge, you cannot touch knowledge that well. It is virtual. The, the ethical aspects and the power aspects. Okay. What you can do. It is, it is latent. It is uh, potential. Okay. That's why it is virtual. And there, there is an actual part. The actual part is what can be precisely addressed in space and time. You can touch these things. Everything that is actual, you, you can touch it. So there is the, the world of messages, the world of people, and the world of, let's say, bodies. Okay. So you see, uh, there is a, a dialectic between virtual and actual. But there is also a dialectic between signs, beings, and things. So here I use uh, a ternary dialectic between the coding elements, signs, the coded elements, things, and the coders, beings, okay? Or if I use the semiotic vocabulary, there are the signs or the symbols or the signifiers, okay? And the reference, what I am speaking about, this is the thing, and the concepts that are in the mind of someone, the interpreter. Okay, so you have this ternary dialectic that I did not invent, it's already in Aristotle. Okay, it's not even Peirce that invented this. It was also in the, in the medieval philosophy and so on. So, the, by the way, IML is based on <clears throat> six basic variables, virtual, actual, sign, being, thing, and the sixth is 
emptiness, and this is the zero, okay? And then I use some operations and combine these things recursively and I create from these symmetries, ternary symmetry, binary symmetry, and then a symmetry between emptiness and fullness. From all these basic symmetries, I create more complex symmetries with operations. It's, it's an algebraic process. The difficult thing is to create a correspondence between algebraic symmetries that you can compute and semantic symmetries that you can understand. Okay, this is the big correspondence. I think that I have done it. Well, and even if you want to analyze further, you see, you use sign being thing. Sign is more abstract, thing is more concrete, and being is more affective. You can see, talk, 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 talk. The, just to show you the way it is, it is, it is done. And it, it helps you also to distinguish all the aspects of a situation. And you can create a lot of, of tables like this. And I call these tables paradigms. Okay? And then you use the terms of the paradigms and you create grammatical relation between these terms. Okay. I'm not going into all the details. But you have an idea of the, uh, the project, at least. Um, now I would like to conclude. You see, you have the, what people call the Internet of Things. This is the actual, OK? Uh, territories, cities buildings, machines, uh, computers, smartphones, watches, every, uh, wearables, everything that you can imagine, everything that is somewhere that has a, a GPS address. Okay? And then these things are sending and receiving information through binary code into the clouds. Okay, this is the current Internet. Okay. What I want is to multiply the cognitive thunders between this earth and these clouds okay. through a new sensorium, a, a, a 3D immersive simulation representing collective intelligence. Okay. And through this sensorium will emerge reflexive collective intelligence. Uh, and we will be able to observe our own cognitive processes, our own collective cognitive processes. I know that it sounds crazy, okay? But I am used to it. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you, <laughs> you see there are a series of code, this is binary code, up the semantic codes that from this information creates the sensorium, and we will interact with the sensorium through our natural languages and through our senses. Okay, this is the, the human part at the end. Okay, so... Thank you very much. <laughs> bueno, muchísimas gracias al profesor Pierre Levy. Muchas gracias por la exposición, por la provocadora exposición. Eh, muchas gracias por la didáctica. Este ha sido muy claro y seguramente hemos tenido una pequeña degustación 
¿no? una, 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 una pequeña entrada, ¿no? Le, eh, se, se parle plat principal. Se le... ah, <risa> no, 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 yo no sé, yo no sé bien. <risa> Él me decía, bueno, voy a hacer una presentación. Bueno, este, ha sido muy interesante, muy provocadora y nos da para muchas cosas. Una, una cosa que me decía recién el profesor Levy es que él se lleva bien con el castellano. Puede, ¿Vos comprenez bien el español? Oui. Bueno, pas toujours, mais... Parce que, eh, no, él, él estudió latín y, y, y por supuesto este, allí estaba la base de muchas de las lenguas romances que él maneja y así que puede recibir las preguntas en castellano y se las voy a leer o hacer una traducción en lo posible. Pero le interesan mucho las preguntas. Eh, yo le dije recién, eh, yo voy a resumir tres o cuatro preguntas y me dijo, no, 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 no quiero eso, quiero la pregunta como la hizo el público y que se la, se la eh, presente a él. Así que los, los esperamos con preguntas, pero eh, como soy el coordinador y tengo el derecho de primera pregunta, <risa> eh, en realidad se me ocurrieron varias, pero... Quisiera empezar, profesor, por una pregunta muy gruesa, digamos, y, y, eh, y tal vez este, por un aspecto que a muchos de nosotros se nos viene cuando escuchamos su exposición y cuando leemos también lo que usted ha escrito. Y es que esta propuesta, este modo en el cual hoy existe Internet, la web, etc., en, en sus distintos estadios, digamos así, y la, pro, la propuesta de la creación de un código semántico y, la, y la, la creación de esta inteligencia colectiva, colaborativa, etc. Eh, usted la imagina en un territorio que es Internet, digamos, que tiene hoy estrategias económicas muy fuertes, estrategias de poder muy fuertes, y que si yo ingreso en ese terreno, ingreso también en un territorio donde voy a competir con grandes jugadores como Google y voy a entrar allí a dialogar o a interactuar porque justamente en su propuesta la idea no es crear una pequeña comunidad de hombres sabios que inter, intercambien saberes, sino que extraer esa inteligencia colectiva que hay en la sociedad y que se produce en la sociedad y que justamente, usted bien dijo hoy, Google se aprovecha de esa, usa esa inteligencia colectiva, lo que pasa es que aparte de eso tiene encima un modelo de negocio muy poderoso eh, sobre el cual además hay grandes debates internacionales. Hoy nos enteramos acá en Buenos Aires que la Unión Europea le inició un juicio a Google en los tribunales comerciales internacionales por, por deslealtad en la competencia porque Google es el, el gran jugador que elige quienes compiten en el mercado de compraventas de la web. ¿no? O sea que es un terreno de poder, es un terreno económico muy, muy poderoso, tal vez en, en un crecimiento que tampoco imaginamos. ¿no? La economía, el e-commerce, cómo va a, a funcionar, está en plena explosión. ¿Habrá una moneda virtual dentro de poco? Ya la, ya la hay, pero, pero se popularizará. Entonces, mi pregunta sería más bien... Exactamente, el Bitcoin. Pero mi pregunta sería, en ese sentido, ¿cómo imagina usted un modelo eh, eh, como el que está proponiendo en medio de un territorio donde hay estas estrategias de poder? En dos minutos. No. <risa> ok. You know, currently we have more possibilities to express ourselves, mm -hmm. to communicate, to collaborate, to have access to knowledge and so on, than 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there are still big capitalist companies, uh, uh, relationship of power mm -hmm. between big countries and between companies and countries like mm -hmm. European Union and so on. So the f there will be, let's say, all... I, I, it could sound strange, but I am not a utopian. 
I don't think that we will reach a situation when there will be no more uh, oppressive political power, mm -hmm. no more uh, economic exploitation, no more uh, differences between uh, of, of, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. I just say that we will reach a new cognitive level. And we already did it in the past, okay? Because nomadic tribes that had only uh, oral communication knew less and uh, lived, the, the, the people in this situation lived until 30, 35, 40 years, you were already a very old man, and you, you, you were going to, to, to die very soon, okay? We live in, way better, in a way better situation. Mm. There are much more human beings on the planet, okay? But there is also much more inequalities between mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to choose. Very few people who know nothing and who die very soon, mm -hmm. and almost everybody the same, mm -hmm. and because this was <laughs> the situation. You know, if you were the, the chief of uh, the, this kind of, of tribe, mm -hmm. there was n not a great difference between the member of the tribe and the chief. Mm -hmm. Today, there is an enormous difference, mm -hmm. but... You know, it's also just a symbolic difference, okay? Mm -hmm. You are the president or the king or you have such a uh, big amount of money mm -hmm. on your co bank account, but anyway, you're still a human being and you are going to die as the rest of us. Okay, the, the, the basic condition is the, is the same, okay? Mm -hmm. And your wife can still leave you. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so, and about Google, okay, I had the same questions 20 years ago, but the big bad guy, the villain at the time was Microsoft, and before this it was IBM, and before this it was, they will pass. Okay, the, every the power is not something that lasts very long. Mm. So there will be people who will exploit these new, these new possibilities. My um, mm, the, the the direction in which I am uh, working is beyond these mm -hmm. uh, social conflicts. And I don't pretend that there will be no more social conflicts. That's not at all my point. I just pretend that we will be collectively more, uh, more intelligent, more knowledgeable. We will have a better consciousness of what we are doing together. Una persona que hizo varias preguntas, este, yo voy a leer una que me parece que le puede servir para aclarar algún aspecto eh, de, de la, justamente de lo, de lo que fue su exposición. La persona pregunta, ¿se imagina usted posible aprender el código que propone para que la mayor parte de la población acceda a esa inteligencia colectiva? Sí, yes, of course. That's the, that's the point. I mean, the, the code that I have invented, and again, I'm not pretending that it is the code that I have invented that will be used. As I have invented this code, I know that something like this is possible and probably will happen. You see the, the reasoning, okay? So, of course, the idea is to create an interface between human intelligence that works with intuition, natural language, and so on, 
and the machines. The machines will be able to manipulate this code as they can manipulate logical reasoning or numbers today. They will be able to manipulate concepts and relationship between concepts and networks of relationships between concepts. That's the idea. Hay una persona que hizo dos preguntas que me parece que pueden acercarnos eh, al mundo también de la educación. Hay, hay algunas varias preguntas este, relacionadas con los temas de la educación. Y hay muchas personas acá sentadas. Usted tiene un auditorio muy calificado esta noche. Hay varias personas que pertenecen, pertenecen al mundo de la educación. Y dice una de ellas, ¿cuáles son los nuevos sentidos que tendría la alfabetización? ¿Se podría caracterizar los procesos de alfabetización de inteligencia colectiva? Es decir, ¿cómo se, ¿cuál es la relación entre ah. la producción de la, de la inteligencia colectiva y los nuevos procesos entonces de alfabetización? Ok. Very interesting question, and it will help me to answer again your question. Muy bien. Because I think that it's better for people to be able to read and write that than not being able to read and write, okay? I don't mean that people who cannot read and write are uh, under humans, okay? Not at all, they are complete and fully respectable human beings as every one of us, okay? But I think that we should give them all the possibilities to learn how to read and write, okay? Uh, and this, when this ability is distributed into a population, there is an improvement of collective intelligence. Okay, people can read newspapers, they can read books, they can uh, fill administrative forms. No, no, I suppress this. Uh, <laughs> You know, these kind of things. But you could say, ah, but why did the state force all these? Why did the state, nation states, ah, sorry. Why did the nation states force people to go to school? Mm -hmm. Because it's, uh, it's mandatory, you don't have choice, okay? To be good soldiers, to be good workers in, in factories, mm -hmm. to be exploited by capital, and so on. Mm -hmm. For this reason, I am against alphabetization. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay, you, you understand what I mean. It's not because there are powerful forces that uh, sustain this movement towards uh, uh, more powerful collective intelligence that you should be against it, okay? You have to moderate these forces and to accompany this movement towards the development of human cognition. That's my mm -hmm. orient political orientation, if you want. Yeah. Uh, I am a, you know, I, do, 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 Okay, I'm going to answer to, to, to your question, what is my political orientation? Okay. Um, you know, in the 20th century, there was a big fight between totalitarian materialisms, like Nazism, they were racist, or let's say, uh, communist, everything is matter, and so on. Uh, religion is forbidden, and so on. So, between totalitarian materialism and agnostic liberalism. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, you can believe what you want, this is agnosticism, and we allow, in certain limits, the expression of your your thoughts that you you have free expression mm -hmm. personally i am 
a liberal gnostic. So this, <laughs> this, this <laughs> voilà. liberal means you can ex, uh, you have freedom of expression. Gnostic and not agnostic. Okay. Gnostic. Because I have faith in the development of human cognition. Mm -hmm. That's my political position. Muy bien. Voy a usar ese final. <laughs> Esa, esa este, confesión que nos ha hecho esta noche, <risa> eh, para una, una pregunta muy atractiva que alguno de ustedes ha dicho y que me, a mí me gusta lo que pregunta. Pregunta si, ¿en qué sentido incluye el control, las políticas de control, en la inteligencia colectiva reflexiva? Y dice la persona, yo pienso más en un caos en el sentido positivo del caos. Ok. Um, my position is that with the enormous quantity of data that we produce every day and that is available online, I think it's a little bit absurd to imagine that we are going to protect our privacy, our personal data, and so on. Mm -hmm. Because anyway, all these data are in the hands of Google, Facebook, mm -hmm. the NSA, everything. Or a lot of act a lot of powerful big actors. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I say, instead of trying to um, to to stop the the spies from spying or to stop the, the merchants from selling, or the, which would not work, I say we should all have access to all the data. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea of symmetric transparency what, that's, that you retweeted. In a, yes. mm -hmm. So it's not What is unjust is that some people, we are transparent for some people, but these people are not transparent for us, and even worse, because I don't care of these people. We are not, there is no transparency of ourselves for ourselves. Okay, so my proposition is symmetric transparency. That's my position. Le voy a contar algo. Eh, en, la, en la página de Facebook de OSDE, hoy se anunció su conferencia. Y allí hubo gente que puso preguntas antes de su conferencia. <risa> o sea que conocía su obra. Digamos. Okay. Una pregunta que le voy a leer viene de ahí. <risa> Dice, ¿se puede decir que en la inteligencia colectiva hay dos grupos de personas? Los influenciados por la inteligencia colectiva y los que dirigen a la inteligencia colectiva manejan esa inteligencia colectiva se aprovechan de esa inteligencia colectiva you can say that you can say that sometimes some people are more leaders and some people are, are more followers and generally there are more followers <laughs> than leaders but what is interesting is that um, I am a leader, let's say, in philosophy, mm -hmm. but in gastronomy, I am a follower. Okay. And uh, it's different for mm -hmm. every one of us. And in addition, there are shifts in time. You are not always mm -hmm. a leader, and you are not always a follower. You, mm -hmm. We have to think of, about diversity, multiplicity, and change in time. So, of course, there are these asymmetries, okay, but it's, it changes all the time and there are different point of views. Uh -huh. Bueno, en este, le dije que había mucha gente del mundo de la educación uh -huh. acá. Hay muchas preguntas relacionadas. Pero hay una que se relaciona con esto, que es cómo articular estos procesos reflexivos de la inteligencia colectiva y la velocidad del desarrollo de la tecnología 
contra los procesos de aprendizaje reales mediados por la cultura existente y por toda la normativa existente que tiene sus tiempos, etc. instituciones. Ok. I don't know if you remember Seymour Papert. Do you remember Seymour Papert? You like Seymour Papert. <laughs> All the, 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 the pedagogical minds, they love Seymour Papert. Do, do you know him? Okay. So what did he say? The best way to learn is to understand the way you think. Mm -hmm. And the better way to understand the way you think is to be reflexive. Mm -hmm. So the project of collective, of reflexive collective intelligence is a project to improve our collective learning. So uh, it, it's a gift for educators. Bueno, eh, última pregunta. Eh, por, no solo última para no cansarlo al profesor Levy, sino porque además tenemos un tiempo de finalización de nuestra actividad. Eh, dice, en el nivel sen sensorial, ¿cómo influye el sentido de pertenencia y encuentro de las comunidades digitales en la alimentación de la inteligencia colectiva? Here I'm obliged to go into technical details. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's imagine, for example, that the semantic relationship between data mm -hmm. are represented in a geometrical way by forms, distances, mm -hmm. mainly distances, okay? And that the intensity of approbation or disapprobation are represented by light, mm -hmm. for example. So you will know immediately what subject is close to this other subjects and what people are liking or not liking and you will be able to select, as you want, some set of data or some set of people mm -hmm. or some set of concepts and see what are the related data, the related person for this concept, what are the related concepts and the related persons mm -hmm. for this data, And for each person, you will be able to observe, like in, in a kind of a virtual sphere of all the concepts that have been used by this person and all the data that has been used. You, you will have a kind of uh, semantic aura. There will be a semantic aura around every person and around every data set or even around every place, okay? For mm -hmm. example, you are walk, walking into Buenos Aires, and at this building, you will put your Levy glasses, mm -hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> you'll see who uh, uh, inhabited this house, and what are all the historical information that is related, and so on. Really. Los, los anteojos, Pierre Levy están a la venta cuando salimos de acá. <risa> quiero... No, quiero decir dos cosas. Eh, primero, eh, en nombre personal, este, pero sobre todo en nombre de las instituciones, de, de la OEI, este, eh, que, que me ha 
eh, invitado también a participar en esto especialmente. Quiero agradecer mucho su presencia acá, eh, agradecer su calidez, agradecer además su, su paciencia lingüística y pedagógica que ha tenido con nosotros. Y quiero decir que muchas de las personas que nos han escrito han agradecido esto también, así que se lo transmito a usted, que es un gusto haberlo tenido esta noche en Buenos Aires y que esperamos tenerlo pronto nuevamente por acá. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias.